This is the Flyerdelphia Podcast, part of SportstalkPhilly.com, with Kevin Durso, Rob Riches, and Dan Heening. Hello, Flyers fans, and welcome to another edition of the Flyerdelphia Podcast, part of SportstalkPhilly.com. I'm your host, Kevin Durso, joined by Rob Riches and Dan Heening. So here we are at the dawn of another season. Rookie camp will begin in just a few days. In one week, training camp officially opens and the start of the 2018-19 season will be upon us. And as we make our return from the summer as well, we are going to go back and kind of look at a discussion um, regarding everything that's happened over the off season. And that's what we want to do before we even get into everything with the new season. We're going to spend this new season, this 2018, 19 season with you. We'll be coming to you on a regular basis throughout the season. Goal. Our goal is weekly uh, in some capacity. It may not be all three of us, but we will be trying to get you something new once a week and trying to throw in a few little added features as well uh, that you'll be able to find on Facebook or on our YouTube channel or things like that. And we have a lot of exciting things developing too around the podcast as well that we'll get into toward the end of the show. Um, But for now, let's get to the meat of everything here. And we're here to talk about the overall scope of the off season. And granted, you look at the timeline of the Flyers off season and really it goes from the end of April to now, but the off season, the heart of the off season really kicks in once the Stanley Cup has been awarded, once the final is over, once everything has ended on the ice for all 31 teams. And you you have the draft, you have free agency, you have players re-signing, and that's a big part of it. And those few months in between or the end of July and all of August are kind of a dead period and it gives you time to reflect. It gives you time to kind of think about where the team is going in. So that's all things we're going to look at and discuss on this show this week. It's the draft, it's free agency, it's the additions and departures and so much more. So I'm going to bring the guys in uh, now and we're going to start with just the moves that were made in the off season to start with. The big addition was obviously James Van Riemsdyk, and that's a big free agent signing. That's a big name, and those are things that uh, are valued. Um, Players like that are valued in the free agent market, no question. And it kind of puts the Flyers back on the map a little bit as players in a different sense. The draft was always the name of the game for Ron Hextall, and he goes and he makes a splash this year. The the other addition uh, made this offseason was Christian Follin, a defenseman, which is more of a depth move, but still necessary. They were looking for a right-handed shot who was a depth defenseman. They've got him in Christian Follin. The departures, on the other hand, were pretty much – a law on par with expectation. It's Valtteri Filppula, Brandon Manning, Peter Morazic, Matt Reed. That that list was kind of established at the end of last season. So let's start with that portion of it and just go off of the draft and free agency, knowing what the draft meant to this sort of rebuild, if you will, over the last few years. And now that free agency has become a bigger part of it, the JVR signing really says it all with that. What do you guys think of this as, in terms of a, an offseason? Does it move the Flyers in that direction that they're looking to go? Is, it, is this a sign that they're a growing team and they're getting more toward the direction that they want to be? What is What are your thoughts on just the moves that were made individually? JVR, Folan, the players that were drafted, and the players that have also left as well. I think a lot of it is based on the perception of the team, Kev, is that uh, you, you have a, a the, the perception of the team. A lot of people who may not follow it as closely or have more of a, a national following or, you know, uh, you know, national media following or what have you. Um, uh, for, for example, there was something that I heard, heard not too long ago. I believe it was Matt Larkin on the Hockey News podcast. You know, he thinks that the uh, the Flyers could conceivably finish with the most points in the Eastern Conference in the 2018-19 season. And uh, the result of um, the uh, the NHL 31-31 and 31 series, 31 teams in 31 days, uh, they, they put out a fan survey, uh, and the, the, the Flyers, by a 55 or, – or, let me rephrase that. Uh, 55% of people who answered the uh, Flyers surveys on social media believe that the Flyers could finish with more points this season 
uh, than last season. So it looks like that the Flyers could be at that point where even if they're they're not maybe if they're not ready to turn the corner this year, it's something where they can get set to turn the corner, and it's something where they can get you know a, a lot more eyes on them, you know, enter the spotlight a lot more, and uh, you know figure things out from there. And you know it's something where the the way I see it is that the Flyers they're they're in a good position right now to be able to make a splash. You know they. Uh, when you when you look at it, it's, uh, I said the same thing when they entered the playoffs, uh, the first round against Pittsburgh, where you know they're basically no matter what they did, it didn't matter because you're coming off an Eagle Super Bowl win, a Villanova National Championship. Uh, the Sixers were in their first playoff uh, in the playoffs for the first time since 2012, and uh, you know even over the course of the summer, we've seen a, you know Aaron Nola with the Phillies, and you know the Phillies you know playing first place ball and still in the middle of a pennant hunt in the, in September. So it's one of those things where the, the, the Flyers, I mean, there's a lot going on and the Flyers have a chance to help build off of that. Well, uh, one thing that I wanted to, to bring up and to add to the perception that uh, point that Rob just uh, made is that when was the last time the Flyers landed a free agent, like a top tier free agent for not that huge of a, uh, of a contract now, you know, five times $7 million. That's, that's a lot of money, but it isn't like that, albatross of a contract that we've seen before with uh flyers signing free agents and, and to me that means that the flyers are, have actually changed their perception around the league internally so now players might actually want to go to play in philadelphia to play in philadelphia without having to spend a lot of money to bring them there without having to give them nine years times like you know a thousand a thousand years with like uh ten million dollars or whatever brisgolov's freaking contract was um it, the perception, it, and that would help too. That will help too with the Flyers with uh, trying to make that splash that Rob is trying to uh, that Rob is talking about. Because if the Flyers can add free agents going for, uh, forward, you know, for less money than let's say like you know because they overpaid you know Dale Weiss and all that. So if you can add guys at a, at a fair market value, then you have a chance to uh, increase the depth of your team without taking away too much from the cap. It's always going to be above market value in free agency because you know the best players always have control of the market but if you can land players at a little bit closer to a, a more team friendly deal then you can help going forward and improving your team uh in the future and trying to win the stanley cup i want to touch on points made by each of you guys actually um i think to rob's point uh about the city in general and talking about the way that a lot of the other teams in the city have started to reach that that point of contention or that point where Everything is starting to become magnified. You know, you have the Eagles winning a Super Bowl and the buzz and the euphoria around an event like that lasting for six and that months. And that is a friendly reminder that the Philadelphia Eagles are still Super Bowl champions. For now, they are. It all begins on – it was the Thursday night game against the Falcons starts the uh, quest towards the next one, I would say. So um, – but beyond that, it's – that's the start of it. The Sixers had so much buzz. And I think I think a thing with the Sixers that is important to this narrative is they want a playoff series. It's not just that they made the playoffs. They want a series. And that's where the Flyers are kind of getting to that point where it's start to take this to the next level. Making the playoffs in the last, you know, in three of the last six seasons was fine when everybody else was missing the playoffs to an extent, you know. The Phillies were a mess and going through a rebuild. The Eagles had a whole coaching debacle. The Chip Kelly thing was just a mess. And the Sixers were trusting the process. And it, and that's not to say that doing something like that doesn't necessarily work, but basically you knew you had a last place basketball team. You had a football team that came in with a lot of expectations around the new head coach they had. The goal was to be what they have been over the last six months and they didn't come close to that because it was just a disaster. And then the Phillies were kind of locked in between that place where you admit you're rebuilding and you actually do it. So you're kind of getting everything coming around on the up and up now and everybody's on the rise. And the Flyers were kind of just plateauing off. They'd have a year, then they'd go back down and they'd miss the playoffs. They'd have a year where they kind of, again, they show something late. They find a way to get into the playoffs. and then they're not and and every time they've made the playoffs it's been here's six or seven games and we'll, we'll give it a fight but we don't win the series and 
the narrative constantly goes back to it's a growing team, it's a growing team, it's a growing team. You're starting to overuse that excuse to an extent. Uh, excuse isn't the word I want to use there, but that's probably the best way to describe it just because you don't want to keep resting on we're still growing. Everybody's a year older on this team, even the younger players, and make no mistake about it, playing a six-game series against Pittsburgh last year was a valuable experience for every one of those kids who was playing in their first playoff game in game one that, for lack of you know a better wording here, got ripped to shreds in game one. You take it on the chin, and you come out of it a better team the following year. Now, that being said, uh, I want to go to Dan's point about free agency and picking up players and being able to make that splash without getting yourself in too much trouble. In no way does the JVR contract do anything to the Flyers going forward because they had additional cap space to do that in the first place. When you had as much cap space as they did, you knew you could go into the free agent market and be a little bit more ambitious with it because there was money to spend. You didn't want to overspend. You didn't want to throw it all away on players that you may regret keeping down the line. And at the same time, you wanted to make an indication that you were ready to start to try to turn the corner and you get a player in JVR who comes out of his time in Toronto, a more mature player, a better goal scorer than he was when he was in Philadelphia, much more established. And you know what to kind of expect with him. He was, he was always kind of a guy in his three years in Philly where you didn't know what you were going to get out of him from one year to the next because he came in as a rookie, he was a second overall pick, and everybody kind of thought he was supposed to be this big points guy, and he wasn't completely he – he had a very solid rookie season. But after that, it was what are you going to get out of him? And it kind of just led – one thing led to another, and that's kind of where the trade came from and kind of giving up on him early as they've done with a lot of – prospects in the past. And that's not the narrative this time around. But I think in addition, not only talking about a five-year contract, $7 million average annual like that, where it's not over the top and it doesn't leave you cap strapped like it did in years past. I also think that you can look at the deals that other players have taken too, because Dan mentioned, maybe this is an indication that people just want to come to Philadelphia to play in Philadelphia and not necessarily a money grab situation. I think you can also look at the contract that Wayne Simmons had from his from the last time he signed, which was certainly cap friendly for the type of player that he was, and the contract that Shane Gostas Bear signed to get past his rookie deal. And my little argument to that, Kevin, would just be that that was internal, so that they already knew, like they were already well versed with how the organization was going to run things, and so maybe that is kind of the way JVR would see it because he's already been a flyer, but. You can you can you can re-sign players internally, like as restricted, or you know just otherwise, like your your deals up in a year, and you can mi- maybe like get them to do a more team friendly thing by convincing them, like ah, oh, yeah, if you take the deal, we'll bring in somebody else, we'll give you more money, uh, or you take less money, we can bring in somebody for more money, and then we can actually win. Whereas if you're trying to f- sign a free agent, guys usually just trying to like max out his uh, his bottom line and trying to make as much money as he possibly can in the, the years he has left. Yeah, and I understand that, and and I, I know I'm referencing internal moves here and internal moves that were made when these players were still young enough to still be restricted free agents and sign a deal like that, but I think I think the term of those deals was significant too. Both players took six-year deals at that time, and to take deals of that, of that size and that term at that time for a cap hit that you probably felt like, like I, I think, look at what Wayne Simmons said previously. Uh, in his most recent media availability when he was in Toronto uh, about contract talks. And while talks are continuing, it's also something where he said he doesn't feel like he has to come in this season and prove anything. He just needs to be healthy and do what he's done every other year that Flyers fans have seen him. And I understand that to one sense, but at the same time, that's a guy who's kind of trying to say, I don't need to establish myself as anything more than what I am because I was a 30 goal scorer before this and yeah, I had injuries and I didn't score 30 last year and I missed missed games for the first time in a while, but I'm still here and I still know who I can be and I expect to turn that into something and for people to see what I can do. It's no secret that it's a contract year for him. So he's going to go out and, and perform and I don't want to make that sound like a thing where 
people are trying to get something out of that before free agency the following year. There's people who are looking at Wayne Simmons and and trying to figure out the best way possible to get something in return for a player that they are not sure is going to be back after this year. And that's just the nature of the business. And I don't like that talk because I don't want to sit there and say, definitely trade Wayne Simmons this offseason. Obviously, they didn't. They're going to go into next season with him still on the final year of his contract. But I wouldn't want to give him up for something at this point, not after the year that he had while he played through the injuries and knowing what he's capable of doing. I kind of want to see everything together at this point. I want to see where Simmons fits into the lineup now that JVR is back in the lineup. I want to see how the power play units look now that you've kind of been proven to have success with Nolan Patrick as a player in the front of, as a net front presence on the power play, Wayne Simmons as a net front presence, and you know what kind of net front presence JVR provides. You've got three guys who can do that, who can play that role on the power play, and you're going to be able to fill two units doing that in some capacity. So I want to see all of that factor in as well. I don't want him shipped off effective immediately. If you were going to do that, then you should have done it at, at the draft to try to either improve your draft position to get a better prospect who was more NHL ready at the, at that time, or you weren't going to do it at all, unless the or unless you were getting a player in return who replaced what Simmons brought in a lot of different ways, and it's hard to replace a player like that. So I'm fine with him being on the team because I want to see – this as a whole. I want to see what kind of depth they have now that you can establish the top six, knowing who those top six are effectively. And that's all important. And another reason that you don't want to give up on Wayne Simmons necessarily or get rid of him now is because for exact reasons like what happened to Sean Couturier, you never know when you're going to have to dip into the top nine somebody on that third line who's capable of playing second line and move that person up because injuries dictate that you have to. And that's a big thing too. You you need to be able to have flexibility among the top nine to be able to mix and match, find the right combinations and know who's going to work there. And those are things that are just as important here. And I, I think that at the very least, the whole off season centers around JVR at this point, that was the big signing And JVR's production next season should replace everything that you got from any player who left this offseason. Everybody knew Philpola was done after that year. That was a contract that you didn't want to keep anymore. And that was a player that, while he had some moments as a depth player, wasn't cutting it. Brandon Manning, same thing. You know, had his moments was able to turn that into an opportunity somewhere else, but that it was not going to happen here knowing what you had coming in the future and knowing that you had to find spots for people. It was easy to pull those guys out of the picture. And that's kind of where this off season comes down to it is that you took the steps necessary in, in a sense by not doing much of anything. You know, we're talking about two additions here. One's another depth defenseman who, I don't know how much he's going to play. And then JVR is obviously a big part of the offseason and a big part of the lineup moving forward here. But the players that didn't return by not acting on anything with that and, and knowing from the end of the season that that was probably the end of the line was enough of an action in a way. That was enough of an action to start taking that move forward here, opening up spots for competition, opening up spots where guys who were playing maybe playing fourth line minutes and just not seeing the ice that much. So we kind of don't know how they fit into the depth mold as much, you know, like this is an opportunity for somebody like Scott Lawton to be a big part of the team next season and to get minutes outside of fourth line minutes that we've seen. Kevin, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Essentially the off season has just been low impact losses with the high impact addition in JVR. I think you summed it up great. Just right there. And, and I don't want to make it sound like that that move, you know, this is one of the things that I wrote about recently was, and this is something that we can all discuss as well. How close are they to being a contender at this point and being a Stanley Cup contender? Rob, you referenced uh, Matt Larkin from the Hockey News and uh, how he also not only in what he's doing with the podcast and things like that, but he also had a series of pieces on the Hockey News uh, looking at teams' Stanley Cup windows. And he's not going as far as to say that the Flyers are in win-now mode and that JVR is that over-the-top kind of thing. But I thought this was something that I thought was very interesting. 
the literally he put down that the only thing that's keeping them from the window being wide open is goaltending. And so I, I find it interesting that his point uh, that the Flyers could be a team that comes out of the um, that comes out of the division with the most points uh, or possibly be a division contender or something like that or be one of those top point teams in the Metro is significant because I'm kind of looking at that and going, A, what's his thought on goaltending, how the goaltending will perform uh, depending on who he thinks is going to be there. Um, and also, how many more points does he think that's going to take to be better than that? This is a team that started to make a play for 100 points last season. They were borderline there. So so going up is a significant statement because you're going to get back into that range. And I, I find it, again, I'm going to go back to what he kind of wrote here, and, and I find it interesting that this is how it's phrased, the minute – Carter Hart gets his NHL chance Philly should enter its prime years he's that good and I kind of so I kind of pitched the question following that which which was is Carter Hart really that much of the answer that the only missing piece that separates the Flyers from a deep playoff run into May Eastern Conference final we're talking things like that is Carter Hart and goaltending is that really the only piece or is there more to this picture? I think there's more to this picture because I still don't know what you have beyond the top six. I know pieces that should be there, but I don't know that they're going to be there. And I don't know how you're going to stack that up and where you're going to play people and in what role. I think we saw lineups last season that had a lot of the right pieces in place uh, in the lineup, I should say, but in the wrong places. And that's a big step to it. At some point in time, you have to put everybody in the right spot. And you have to start figuring out which chemistry works and give yourself the best chance to win games. And more or less, that's why I, I kind of said, we can talk about them being a contender all we want to and Carter Hart getting here and things like that. A, let's not rush the kid to get in goal immediately. If he, if he proves he's ready, that's great. If he doesn't and he goes to the minors, it's exactly the place he needs to be for that first year as a pro. There's no, you know, no reason to sit there and instantly crown him as the as the savior and put him in there. Let him play a professional game here and let's see uh, what he's got and let's see him in training camp in the preseason before we do any of that type of stuff. At the same time, JVR makes the Flyers that much better of a team, in my opinion, that you shouldn't be clinching a playoff spot on the final weekend of the season anymore. You should be getting into the playoffs comfortably and you should be, at the very least, you better be closing in on winning a playoff series. And I don't know how much more, you know, you you've played two playoff series under Dave Haxtell now, and each is going six games. And essentially you're sitting here talking about how you're two wins away. And in game six, both times you were in a position where it could have gone the other direction in game six against the capitals in 2016, you lose a one nothing game that's a goaltender's duel, and that's that's just the way that it goes in cer- in certain situations. You just got beat by a more established team and a better goalie. Understood. It was a one nothing game. You go to the game six in April this past year, and you're leading that game heading into the later stages of the second period. You have a four two lead at some point. You have to clamp down and finish the job there, and you were that much closer to possibly forcing a Game 7, and who knows what happens. They probably don't win that game. But beside the point, you don't want to halt the progress here or have the progress be stalling out in first-round playoff appearances and early exits. You need to start getting deeper into the playoffs. And I think that this team, if they are able to put it all together and find the right combinations and players keep maturing the right way, you know, Ivan Provorov's established himself as a clear number one in, on this team as a defenseman, but he's got to continue to be that, and he's coming off of a major injury as well, though he should be good to go. And same thing with the top line, with the top six. And then you just need you need passable goaltending here. You need goaltending that will get you there. At the same time, and I, I, we were kind of discussing this before we started to record the show, um, Let's talk about, in addition to how close they may be to being contenders, 
this kind of narrative of mediocrity that they've had over the last five seasons. And this was a thing that came out, uh, 538 Sports did a story and used an algorithm that they created that referenced things like point percentage, goal differential, things like that, to come up with the most average team and most mediocre team in sports. And they did it for the current calendar year 2018 and kind of deducted that the Pittsburgh Pirates in baseball were that team for the calendar year. But over the course of a five-year standpoint, they deducted that the Flyers were the uh, team that was the most mediocre and, and even captioned it as for, te- for fans seeking long-term mediocrity. The Flyers might be a good option because they finished with uh, between 39 and 42 wins in four of the last five seasons. The one season they didn't, they uh, still had 18 overtime losses, which tr- could basically essentially translate to ties, which is the best outcome for fans of 500 play. Um, basically, the final statement on that one was, according to their algorithm, no team in major pro sports has been more consistently mediocre over the past five seasons than the Philadelphia Flyers. So you guys take me through this here because we, ha- we have a situation here, or this is the kind of narrative here, you're riding a narrative of mediocrity, but you're also riding a narrative of hope and turning the corner and the window is going to open soon. Does it come down to the goalie that much? Uh, like in terms of, is it just that one player and that's all we need to talk about at this point? Or is there more to this picture that separates you from mediocrity to contention? I, I think that when it comes down to it, yeah, I mean, you're mediocre over the fa- uh, past five seasons because you, you, you're embarking on a rebuild. You know, that that's really what it is. It's uh you know, you're, you're, you're finally tearing down. You're finally shedding what you can. You know, you have Ron Hextall finally shedding, uh, you know, a, a, everything that uh, Paul Holmgren did and trying to build a long-term contender. And, yeah, I mean, it being average over the past five seasons just comes with the territory of a rebuild. You know, it's something where, you know, you're looking to assert yourself as a non-average team. You know, you're looking to take the next step. You're looking to become exceptional, and that's – Obviously, as we, we've uh, well learned by now, that's not an overnight process. I mean, that's, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, you, you, you hate to, to see your team get uh, bagged on like that. But, you know, there's no real issue with it when that's, uh, that's just what comes with the territory of a rebuild. And, and the thing that really sticks in my craw for this particular uh, algorithm article uh, is that it completely eliminates the context of which Rob uh, just told us about is that they were in the middle of a rebuild. And then when you look at these numbers and you're like, oh, well, for fans seeking long term mediocrity, well, you, you are you not paying attention with the fact that now the Flyers are considered one of the teams that are supposed to be on the uptrend that like as as Rob said before in the in the podcast that, you know, Matt Larkin of the the Hockey News believes that they can have the most points in the Eastern Conference. There, you can't ha- you can't just look at the numbers and just assume that this is just like all right, well, this team is mediocre and they'll they'll always be mediocre if that's the way you're gonna try and spin it in this in this t- type of article. There's always a trend up, like what we're getting at here, and this team with young players with uh, being able to spend uh, on spend money on better free agents, spend it more wisely. They're a, they're a team that l- right now looks like they can definitely be in the top three of. The Metropolitan Division. I'm going to call it the Patrick Division because that uh, the division name is uh, dumb. Um, but it, it, if you just take the Flyers in the context now, right now, they can definitely, you know, with Brian Elliott, considering how Brian Elliott plays, if he plays like he did last year, then it should be no problem. I mean, obviously, they're going to be in a battle because the the Patrick division is filled with teams that can absolutely eat your lunch, whether it's the defending Stanley Cup champions, the Washington Capitals, who would ever thought they'd say that out loud, Uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins, which always have Crosby and Malkin eating your lunch, and then you have uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets, which always seem to do well in the regular season. Maybe you don't take last season too much into account, but they should trend up as well. They have young players. They have Sergei Bobrovsky and Nett. As long as it's not the postseason, he's always good. So... If you're if you're uh, if you're a fan of the Philadelphia Flyers, this team should trend up, but you shouldn't expect to like just walk into the playoffs twirling a cane this season. But you can definitely expect that going forward because that's the way this team has been built. That's why they were mediocre, and that's why they're not going to be mediocre in the long term, as opposed to what five thirty eight would t- tell you. Yeah, and I mean, uh, here's here's kind of the way I look at it too. Um, we're so we, we call it a rebuild, but in reality. 
there's people who don't view it as a rebuild because of the fact that they did still win half of their games roughly. You know, it's 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 not maybe I guess when you put them next to the Sixers process and and the idea of teams that tank it doesn't compare because they weren't a team that was trying to lose or be mediocre necessarily. It it was just the f- the fact of the matter is that that's what they were. That was their identity. They were an inconsistent team. Some nights they'd have it and some nights they'd come out and look like the best team in the league and other nights they'd come out and look like the worst team in the league against teams that we thought were the worst team in the league at that time. That's kind of where my statement comes from about getting into the playoffs and getting into the playoffs comfortably. Yeah, you're going to have Washington. Yeah, you're going to have Pittsburgh. You're going to have Columbus and teams like that. But you're going to have teams that shouldn't even register on the radar for making the playoffs this season. And you can't go into games against those teams and treat them any differently than games against Pittsburgh or Washington or anybody like that. The motivation factor has to be elevated this year. It just has to be. You can't go in and and come out and play boring hockey for 10, 15, 20 minutes to open a game and realize later on we took too much time off at the start, so now we're forced to catch up. It's not going to work like that. That's what leads to to mediocrity. It's not playing games through their fullest. It's it's one aspect of it anyway. I mean, in some cases, you have a roster where players are just not good enough anymore, and that's the way that it is. I I find it interesting because one thing that I I've kind of gotten to the point of here in in looking at when it comes to talking about being a contender and and bringing up reaching the ultimate goal here is does anybody you know like. Step back for a minute and think about how hard it is to achieve the ultimate goal in sports and the fact that only one team a year gets to do it. It makes me kind of laugh at how people will shame another team or anything like that over not winning a championship when only one team wins it every year and there's always going to be teams out there that are better equipped to do it than others. At some point in time, you know, Pittsburgh's window is wide open still right now because as long as Crosby and Malkin and Kessel and all those players and Gensel's coming up as a younger player in that core group, as long as guys like that are still around and still effective and still producing at a high level, then yes, you're going to be a contender. But there's going to come a point when that day is out is gone and it's going to be a slow end, you know. I think I think to keep kind of in our reference of going back to the beginning of the show and talking about the city wide scape of sports right now and teams on the rise within the city, look at the way that the Phillies are right now. And I'm not talking about just right now, like, oh, they were playing first place baseball at one point in time. Look at the Phillies going back, kind of reliving 10 years prior, the first championship that the city had in a quarter century. And all of the players from that team that no longer play anymore or that within five years weren't able to play at a high level anymore, that quickly it can all come to an end. So you have to build yourself up to that point, and it's done through homegrown talent. It's done through picking up the right players at the right time, and you can go out and sign a bunch of players and make big trades, and it doesn't always mean you're going to be guaranteed success, but you might make it there, and that's the point. You'll make it there, but the but the fall is sometimes just as heavy. You know, it's sometimes it, the fall can hurt just as much, and it can take a long time to dig back out of that and get back to that point where you were. It wasn't that long ago that the Flyers were a team that made it the playoffs on the last day of the regular season, and lo and behold, a few months later, we're playing in the Stanley Cup final. And how many of those players? are still around anymore to even be able to talk about those days on the flyers. There's two Claude Giroux and James Van Riemsdyk. Now that now that he's back, that's it. Those are the only players. And they were young players at that time that were able to talk about that. Otherwise around the rest of the league, there's still some that are still playing, but more often than not, you'll go and you'll look at a list of players who were part of that playoff run and they're no longer playing anymore. You know, think about Mike Richards. Think about Chris Pronger. Think about guys like that. They're no longer playing. Kimo Timon and no longer playing. 
and even you know even guys who are still playing in some capacity who aren't nearly as as big to their teams as they used to be look at the look at how Scott Hartnell was used by Nashville last season and how different it is for him now than it was eight years ago when he was a valued player getting top line minutes and even go a few years beyond that when when Giroux was playing with Hartnell and Yager and Hartnell is coming out of this as an all-star players eventually fall off even the most elite ones will do that there's no question that Sidney Crosby is an is an otherworldly player in the NHL and his career is going to go down as one of the greater ones in in history but it's going to come to an end at some point and when that happens when it happens for Crosby and Malkin and Kessel and it's all at the same time or as they have to filter those players out of their roster the window will start to close and that's how this that's how the process works here it's a cycle you have to get there at in some capacity and the Flyers are trying to do it with Ivan Provorov and while keeping guys like Claude Giroux and Jake Voracek and Wayne Simmons as part of this grouping, Simmons, at least for next year, it's around Ivan Provorov and Shane Gostaspair and Nolan Patrick and Travis Konechny. And when Carter Hart gets here, the goalie will make a difference. And there's other players in the system that aren't even in the NHL yet. Phil Myers, Morgan Frost. These are going to be players that are talked about as the core in the not so distant future. That's what it's got to come down to. And that's where expectations can really start to get tampered when you can actually look at those players and realize that they are your core and they are the reason that you're a contender. It's nice to still have it. And I see people talk about, but aren't they wasting Claude Giroux and guys like that? You can say that, but at the same time, let's see how long it takes for them to be that team. What if, you know, making the playoffs doesn't guarantee you anything at that point. You have to go and earn it in the playoffs too. That's what made the 2010 Flyers such a great run. You had to go and earn it. You had to go and find a way to come back from down 3-0 to Boston. You had to still get, take that, still ride that momentum and win another playoff series before you were playing for the Stanley Cup. You have to ride momentum waves in April and May to get to June. Anything can happen through those two months. So put that all together and let's see what happens once you get on a little bit of a run, if you're able to put together a run. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that, you know, nothing's out of the question next season, but it's not in the expectations. You don't go in expecting that if they turn into that, that's great, but you don't go in expecting that necessarily. It's like, you know, nobody expected Vegas to be there in last season either, but when you get on a roll and you start to win games and win them frequently, Anything is possible. And that's, I think, the thing about it. You're now starting to put yourself in a position where the youth is coming up. You're you're completing this process of building out a contending team. You're getting closer by the, by the day, by the year. And it should all start to come together sooner rather than later. And that's that's really where this is this is going at this point. That's where this needs to be going. So I think what I wanted to do to turn this, to start to turn this towards away from the off season and towards next season is now that we've kind of discussed everything with the additions and subtractions here, the, the players that have been added, the players that are no longer part of the flyers moving forward. Let's get some early thoughts on camp beginning rookie camps going to begin in just a few days. Training camps a week away. It's going to start on the following Friday. So as training camp begins, Is there anybody specifically that you're keeping an eye on here that you're interested in that either you expect to make a difference now or just for curiosity's sake to see how close they are as either junior players or now professional players who are going to be one call away from the NHL? Well, I can tell you that one of the – some of the races that I'll be looking at is because there's this huge – well, maybe not huge – but there's a there's notion that Morgan Frost would be ideal for the third line center spot for the Flyers. But I've been thinking, you know, over the course of, you know, the last two seasons that Mikhail Vorobiev would at least be in contention for the fourth line spot for this season, considering he has a full year of professional experience now with the uh, with the Phantoms last season. Um, 
So you have that idea that maybe – and Morgan Frost comes with a lot of hype where he can play uh, – he's explosive offensively. He's a playmaker. He's sneaky good defensively. And you can put him in a spot where he can play with a, a Wayne Simmons or uh, a Michael Roffel and set them up and get them goals, get them going again. Uh, and so that's interesting to me. It's just I don't know if you're going to set the kid up for failure by doing that so soon. And you also have Scott Lawton who you could potentially put at third line center or keep at fourth line center. And then nobody's going to go up to bat for uh, Yuri Lettinen. So, uh, excuse me, Yuri Letera. Um, so that's one race that I'm 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 looking at. And the other one is everyone's looking at Carter Hart right now to try and make some sort of push to become to get on the Flyers roster. But I'm thinking Alex Lyon is actually closer to doing that. He had a very good AHL. He had a very good playoff run with the Phantoms. Uh, he, he was absolutely incredible and you have kind of a low hanging fruit in terms of the backup spot with uh, Michael Neuvert because he's always hurt. And so you, you don't know when that other shoe is going to drop and, and Alex Lyon can show up and, and get some consistent starts starts going. And you don't know um, particularly if Haxtell kind of runs with Elliot again, uh, the way he did last season, if Elliot's going to break down. So it could very, you could ver- very much see that you could foresee that Alex Lyon could actually be in a position where he could, you know, get a, a, a bunch of starts with the Flyers. So I actually would pay attention more to Alex Lyon, even though the hype is around uh, Carter Hart for this upcoming uh, training camp. One player that, uh, that I myself uh, want to keep an eye on with training camp starting is uh, Mike Vecchione, because uh, you may remember he comes up at, uh, the end of the the twenty or the the, the twenty sixteen seventeen season, and uh, you know there's there's a little bit of hype. You know he comes out of union, and obviously uh, you know Flyer fans remember the last time they they had a union product and they were ready for this guy to uh, tear things up. But then the uh, the, the the Flyers uh, after that, I mean we all remember they kind of fell into the number two overall pick. They get their center of the future in Nolan Patrick and. Uh, what seemed like uh, could have been a sure thing for uh, for uh, Vecchioni was uh, pretty much kind of thrown uh, thrown off to the side because uh, you know there's a new center into the mix. Uh, he could have competed, you know, for a fourth line position, but he ended up spending the whole season with the Phantoms. And uh, last year, I mean, it wasn't exactly much to call home about, but uh, you know, he had 17 goals, uh, 23 uh, assists, 40 points, and. He was only able to play in 65 games, so it's not like he was able to get the full season. But, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, he's hungrier. He's coming into training camp. You know, he's uh, been around before, so he knows a little bit of what to expect. And I'm just uh, I'm curious just to see what, uh, what he can come up with. You know, if he could uh, try to compete for, you know, a fourth-line spot or if, he is, uh, if he's got another year in uh, Allentown in his future. I'm going to echo a little bit of uh... – something that both of you guys said there a little bit. I mean, from a standpoint of both Morgan Frost and Carter Hart here, um, I'm not necessarily as interested in seeing what they have uh, in terms of making a play for the roster this season as much as I am just seeing them in some form of game action during the preseason that puts them up against NHL players. Frost had a great year last year in juniors. There's no denying that, but I feel like from one year to the next, the growth has definitely been there. Let's Before you want to crown the kid and put him into a third-line center role, just put him out there against some NHL talent here. I think one of the big things is that everybody thought Phil Myers was closing in on that spot a year ago. And then he played in the preseason, got an extensive look, and kind of toward the end of the preseason, you kind of found yourself watching him in games and going, you know what? If I had to look at other defensemen who are trying to do the same thing, if I have to look at Sam Moran and I have to look at Travis Sanheim and you looked at Provorov in that way also and you were going, you kind of were able to, and Robert Haig's another one too, you were able to kind of look at all of them and go, they're a step ahead. They're just a little bit, you know, Myers looks like he's just a little bit behind on that and he needs a little bit more work. And it's better to work him as a number one defenseman in the minor leagues than it is as a number seven in the NHL. Understood. And that's, so I want to see that from both Frost and Hart here. Put them into a preseason game and give them a look at, at, at that type of, at that type of competition. 
it's a good way to get there's nothing wrong with getting letting these players get their feet wet during the preseason here those games don't really mean anything for other than to kind of shake off some of the rust they don't mean anything for guys like Claude Giroux or Jake Voracek or anything like that if if nothing else you want those guys to go into the season healthy and ready to go and you don't want to burn them out or have anything happen to them in preseason games so you want to give these other kids a little more of a look and see who fits the mold the best uh, I also you know at that point it does make me interested to see what Myers looks like after a year in in the minors and a year of pro hockey I want to see what he looks like and see how he factors in. I don't necessarily know that there's going to be a spot for him on the roster immediately, but but we know he's close and we know he's gotten better with every passing year here. So nothing wrong with sending him back down to let him play top minutes with the Phantoms again, but just keeping in mind that you know he's close and, and seeing what he looks like against NHL competition. Uh, Vecchione's a good name that I have down as part of the fourth line competition there. And I add Nicholas Abe Kubel too, uh, just because it's another guy who's got that penalty killing depth forward kind of mold to his game and can fit that role really well. So I want to see him in some game action as well. And my kind of thought process behind players like that goes far beyond just prospects at this point. I want to see Jordan wheel get center time during the preseason to see if he's as much of a center as Ron Hextall thinks he is. I want to see Scott Lawton playing more significant time as the preseason goes about as well. Uh, I do want to see Vorobiev and see if he's a fit in that role as well, or if, or in a fourth line kind of role, you never know. Um, there's not many players or vet many veterans. I want to say, um, that are left on the roster that, you know, are going to eventually be cycled out of the picture in the coming years. You know, uh, there, there was a long list two seasons ago where you knew how many players were, um, were veteran players who weren't going to be back as the years kind of went on, as kids got closer to being ready. This is the time to really get a chance to look at everybody. And I'm just, I'm just curious to see what those guys kind of have in them more than anything. And, and, and just to see how that forms out the NHL roster. Sure, we're going to be watching Frost and Hart and guys like that through a microscope because we want to see what they have at that level and to see if they're ready for it. And the hope is that, of course, the hope is that they're ready for it. But there's nothing wrong with Morgan Frost playing another year in juniors. There's nothing wrong with Carter Hart going to the minors. There's nothing wrong with any of that. And I like what Dan brought up about Alex Lyon. Let's face it, at some point in time this year, it's not going to shock anybody when Michael Neuvert gets hurt. It's I'll say, I'll throw out the if he gets hurt kind of thing just to be kind of courteous about it, but every other year that he's been a flyer, it has happened. And it, it, it seems to happen at various points throughout the year, so the flyers are always forced to kind of tap in to the minor leagues and figure out an alternative from there. The big question, I think, when it comes to goaltending is... Brian Elliott and his usage. I don't think Brian Elliott had a terrible year last year. I think he had a year where he would like to have done better. And I think he would have liked to have done better down the stretch. I think he was pretty good through the early part of the year. November was obviously a mess and everybody remembers the losing streak and what that did kind of for everything for morale, for the way that the team spirits were in the locker room performance on the ice suffers as a result of that as well. But I also look at what Brian Elliott was able to do in December and throughout January and into February. For a two and a half month span, he was really good. And that's important to keep in mind, but his usage is going to come into play. And the fact that he did have to miss time twice last season comes into play as well. And that's how Alex Lyon got into game action before. But I throw out two other possibilities here at that point. There, there's certainly a time where you don't know, you know, let's put it this way. You have, all you have to do is look back to the reason that Peter Morazic was on the flyers for a stretch of a month and a half, two months to get your reasoning behind kind of this thought process. What happens if both of them get hurt again? And what happens is you have Alex Lyon who has some NHL experience I'm curious to see how Anthony Stolarz looks now that he should be coming into a training camp ready to go and healthy again. 
he basically missed the entirety of last season recovering from the knee injuries that he had suffered at the end of the previous season and kind of re-aggravated at the start of last season. He basically missed the whole thing. And I didn't think he was a bad prospect going into all of that. I thought, quite honestly, if the knee injury didn't get in the way from from the playoffs the one year with the Phantoms to the start of training camp last season, if nothing gets in the way there, he's the, he was the first call-up, not Alex Lyon. But Alex Lyon took the opportunity to be the go-to guy with the Phantoms when the time came and the Flyers needed to call somebody up. That was the time. And it was it was he was ready to go for it, and he did pretty decent in the games that he had to be in. It doesn't mean he's the long term answer, but he did he did his job for the most part. And at the same time, you also look and, and go if for any reason two goalies are down and out, and you're kind of playing between Lyon Stolars and and Carter Hart being with the Phantoms. Does that expedite? Hart's usage and call up to the NHL. It very well might just because of the fact that at that point, now you're calling up a second guy. I think that if you have to get by for a stretch of a week or something like that, then yeah, you're going to call Lion or maybe you do, maybe you call Stolars, but you're going to call up somebody who's been there, done that, and you're not going to necessarily take playing time away from Hart just because that's who the fans may want to see. But if it comes down to he's going to play and he's done well in the minors, bring him up. There's no reason not to. So I'm curious to see how all of these pieces start to fit together. There's forwards that are going to get opportunities. There's defensemen that should get opportunities. And the goalie situation, while pretty well established going into this season, you know that there's going to be questions as it goes along. And it's just going to come down to who's ready at that time and who's performing well at that time. And whether it's Hart that you give the opportunity to or that you just roll back with Lyon or Stolarz and a guy like that who's much more capable of probably filling in at that point than a guy who hasn't played an NHL game yet, even if Carter Hart is the guy that people are relying on down the stretch, or in the long term, I should say, actually. So as we get ready to wrap things up here, we do also want to touch on one um, one off-season note that didn't really relate to anything with the current team. It's a part of Flyers history, actually, we should say. Uh, but there was some sad news that came out uh, in July uh, where the, with the uh, passing of former Flyer goalie Ray Emery. And we had a story up about that in July on the day that it happened and um, kind of we're just reflecting on him a little bit as a, as a player with the Flyers. He had two different stints with the Flyers and certainly played, you know, he played more than, you know, played his share of games here in Philadelphia, no question about it. Um, what When you look back on Ray Emery's career, as a member of the Flyers or just in general, what's what's the thing that you guys kind of remember about him or just any stories you've got on him uh, as we go forward? Obviously, I think there's one that sticks out in our minds um, that I'm sure we'll reference, uh, but anything else that you guys want to throw in as well? I will. Uh, I, I'll, I'll leave the low hanging fruit for you guys there, Kevin, but uh, I, I, will I, I will it for you. <laughs> I, I I always remember uh, Ray Emery's tenaciousness in Philadelphia. He was uh, obviously you remember his first stint where you know he comes in in the the 2009-10 season and uh, you know uh, is, is is diagnosed with uh, with an injury that was supposed to be career ending. Uh, it was the the same condition that afflicted the legendary Bo Jackson. But uh, you know Emery was uh, was was a battler. You know he battled back and. Decided that he was going to, um, you know, leave his hockey career on his own terms, and you know he absolutely rallied and absolutely uh, busted his ass to get back between the pipes. And for that, I, I give him full credit. And you know, that's something where you know that's a, a lot of other goalies. You know, obviously they, they said that you got to have to have that mental makeup to to play goalie. And but you know, for still a lot of players, I mean, that would have been that. Everybody knows when their time is. But uh, Ray decided that. Uh, you know, his he wanted he still wanted to keep playing. He still had the competitive fire. So I will I give him all the credit in the world for being able to come back from that. I think I feel like that's something that uh, he never really got enough love for. But uh, that's something that I, I still uh, have hold the, the most respect for. Just to echo uh, Rob's thoughts, because uh, having talked to somebody that suffered from uh, avacular necrosis, I know at least through their account how much it can eat away at your joints. And for Ray Emery to come back 
and play a position as goaltender that is so heavy on you know the joints in the hips for him to be able to do that and not only come back and go but play in Chicago and go 17 and 1 as a backup and eventually you know help contribute to them winning the Stanley Cup by doing this so it, it, it's a testament to, to his ferocity to his tenaciousness that will you know will reference with the fisticuffs that he's he's been involved with multiple teams uh, it's it really is sad just because he was so young. He was he's only a few years younger than I am, and the, just the way he the manner in which of his passing of just going for a swim, it's it, it's heartbreaking because it was a you just you would never suspect that something like that having battled back to hit a level of physical fitness where he could come back and play professional sports again, and for that to happen, it's it's tragic for it to happen in any any fashion but for it to happen like that is it's heartbreaking and for him to be remembered as someone who did come back and you know beat a disease that essentially ended the greatest athlete of all time Bo Jackson for him to do that and come back and maybe not be the same goaltender but be but not but not be that far behind from where he was is a testament to what kind of athlete Ray Emery was yeah and I mean I'm not gonna take the low hanging fruit either and bring up that particular moment in his career by any stretch here. Um, but what I will do is just talk about how he did a, a, I will talk about how he did come back in that, in that setting. And, and the fact that he was able to reestablish his career after the first, after that first stint with the flyers and everything kind of came into the picture, he comes back, he does win a Stanley cup as you guys referenced with Chicago. And, you know, I, I do think that it's also worth noting that in his own career, when he when he came back to the Flyers for a second time there, you know, he didn't get to play a whole lot and the team wasn't overly successful with him in goal, but he was there and, and a goalie that they turned to in playoff games. You know, you can't cut you can't leave that off the table, even if it didn't really work out. He was still a goalie that they turned to in in the playoffs at a, at a point in time. And and maybe, you know. In part, there's there's parts of that where Ray Emery perfectly sums up the goalie problem the Flyers have had over the course of the the many years here, where he was just in you know he was another guy with the with numbers in kind of a similar range and the winning percentage wasn't always great and everything like that. But he was a guy who also kind of came in and didn't make an excuse and didn't let that in, that injury and that ailment be an excuse. He came back and he was a tough he was a tough character. I mean. We can look at you know we can look at the fisticuffs and all of that kind of stuff, and note that he was a tough character. But he was tough in in his own right, um, just by being a tenacious presence in the crease. You know you don't have to leave the crease and do something with your do something else with your hands uh, to necessarily represent that. He was a he was the type of player I think when he came in the first time around that was um that really fit the mold of 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 a flyer then too and it's it's kind of cliche but he really did fit that mold pretty well and it's kind of it's just a shame to watch a, a young life you know st- or still relatively young anyway i mean you're talking about a guy who was 35 years old you know it's a shame to watch a young life come to an end he, he might not have had a playing career in hockey anymore but he certainly had every reason to still be around and be around the game and 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 be that kind of person and and have an impact on the game and he and he certainly obviously too being you know he you know he certainly had that kind of going had had all that going for him as well and and being able to have a whole life ahead of him outside of the game or maybe in the game in a different capacity so that's really the shame of it is that that part never gets realized and will never be realized so you know you can take away the the statistics that he had over his career and by all standards you know it wasn't a lengthy NHL career but it was a solid career when you when you look at it he finished with a career save percentage of 906 a 2.70 goals against average in his career and you know those numbers are certainly you know not reflective of his time necessarily in Philadelphia but then again you could also look at the teams he was playing you know behind at that time also and realize that there was a little bit of a, uh, you know, a little bit of a reason behind the numbers in in a sense. It's sometimes you're only as good as a goaltender 
as the team that plays around you. He was obviously tremendous in the year that he won a Stanley Cup with Chicago. So you can be a great goaltender by having a great team around you. And he was that particular year. And with the Flyers, sometimes he wasn't the greatest goaltender, but he was still looked at as a key piece to getting them to the next level. And he won 16 games the year that they made the Stanley Cup final in 2010. So in, in, in that 09 10 season. So he had a big impact on that particular season, even if, you know, even if that's all that he was able to do um, in his career with the Flyers, or that was his mark, that was the mark of his performance in, as a Flyer. He had certainly had many solid years. Um, or a couple good, real couple really good years playing for Ottawa, and he was able to bring his career back a little bit with his time in Chicago, and all of that is a testament to him. So we uh, do offer our deepest condolences, even as time has passed on this um, event happening, this this tra- tragic event happening in mid July. Uh, we do pass along deepest condolences and uh, do definitely pay tribute to him. Um, recently, we've been doing a bit of a countdown to the Flyers regular season opener on Instagram and posting a picture every day. And Wednesday's picture is 29 days until the Flyers season opener. We went with Ray Emery, obviously, as a nod to a nod and a tribute to him. So certainly something uh, that we wanted to touch on before we got off the air this week. And, uh, certainly just something we wanted to bring up and remember one of the members, one of the many members, I mean, the flyers have had so many members, um, in the franchise history. And every time, um, one of them passes on, uh, it's certainly worth remembering in every way. And so we just wanted to do that before we wrapped everything up. Um, before we, officially wrap up the show is there anything else that you guys had that you wanted to add or any final thoughts or anything like that before we move to um before we move on to the wrap up well i've i've you know just you you brought up uh the 2009 uh 2010 season with ray emery um and i just like to you know he he came in with a lot of um he that was like a low risk high reward type thing and him coming in, he actually looked like he was going to be the solution that year because uh, you touched on it. He won 16 games. He had a few shutouts just in the first month alone. And that you can actually, if you go back, you can actually look because he was having hip issues uh, just when everything started to, you know, he's, his play started to go down a little bit. And, uh, you know, he, he kind of, in terms of remembering him as a flyer, because we, if you remember him as an athlete, you remember him beating AVN. Uh, and coming back and being a, a, a really solid backup goaltender. Um, but if you remember him as a flyer, you definitely have to consider what if. What if that never happened? Because if that was a Stanley Cup uh, finalist that year, and if he's and you can argue that goaltending was the was the problem all along. Um, so if he's you know he got dealt a really crappy hand, and you don't want to whine about championships when a man's life is gone, but you. He was a Stanley Cup finalist goaltender, so that could have been a really perfect combination uh, with him and the Flyers back in that season. So with that, we're going to wrap up the show for this week, and that's going to do it for this episode of the Flyer Duffia podcast. We want to thank everyone for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the Flyer Duffia podcast. There are many ways that you can do that, uh, including a few new ways that we want to let you know about this week. Um First off, you can still subscribe as you have been in the past on iTunes and Google Play, as always. Uh, Check us out on YouTube as well. We do have a YouTube channel, and we'll get into that a little more in just a moment. We have added Stitcher and Spotify to our list of platforms, so you can now subscribe and listen to the podcast on there as well. We are also on SoundCloud as part of the Sports Talk Philly podcast network, where you can listen to us and some of our sister shows as well. Uh, there are shows uh, relating to Sixers basketball and uh, Phillies baseball that have been running regularly for the last few weeks uh, with the start of the Eagle season. I'm sure there's Eagles uh, plans in the works as well. That'll be part of that as well. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, we'll be with you throughout the 2018-19 season on the Flyer Delphia podcast. You can expect a new episode every week in some capacity. Uh, we'll also be trying to generate as much content as possible uh, to put up on YouTube and Facebook as well. Um, One thing that I'll be doing personally 
um, is I'll be going on to the Facebook page for kind of an extended podcast Q&A, if you will. That'll be a live Q&A on our Facebook page, which will also be shared to YouTube and across the podcast feed uh, once they are complete. So if you are a subscriber, you will get those as well. Uh, In addition, probably some pre-game and post-game content that will come and go uh, as the season goes on as well, just depending on game times and coverage and everything like that. Um, But definitely a lot to look forward to this upcoming season, more so than just what's going to be happening on the ice. It will also be uh, a lot of good things coming from us as well. Uh, So next week when we return, um, we'll have our topic be kind of getting ready for the actual start of training camp. We'll have a roster at that point. We will have a, um, schedule for uh, certain events aside from just the preseason schedule. Uh, The preseason will also be getting started the following Sunday from when we publish the podcast. So uh, that week. So when we finish up and get that up and running, we'll also um, on that show discuss the start of the preseason, some things with games, players to watch, prospects we're looking to see, and a couple things uh, in relation to that as well. Uh, And, We'll have also be able to kind of touch base on everything with rookie camp and uh, some of the things that have happened there and some of the ways have a little bit more on the prospects. So once again, thanks everybody for listening again, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. We're on iTunes, Google play, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud as part of the sports talk Philly podcast network, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel for Rob riches and Dan Heening. I'm Kevin Durso, and this has been the flyer Delphia podcast on sportstalkphilly.com. This has been the Flyer Delphia Podcast, part of sportstalkphilly.com, with Kevin Durso, Rob Riches, and Dan Heaney.